Lord Jesus, we're here on the first Sunday of a new year. Some of us are full of excitement and joy, and some of us are a little weary and worn out. But we're all here, and so even though we don't like to hear it all the time, we ask you to speak to us through your word because we confess that we need it and because you're loving and good. We pray this in your name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, as you've heard many, several times already, it's the first weekend of a new year. And so all the cliches, right, we should talk about. Let's get those out of the way. About resolutions and goal setting. Anybody make a resolution? A goal of any kind? Anybody? You're not going to tell me if you did, right? I'm not putting it out there. Right? You know, it's, it's a good thing to do, even though it feels a little bit cliche. I saw lots of joke memes about pastors setting the 2020 vision for the year 2020. I'm not going to do that, I promise. But this is the time when we try to make goals and set resolutions and for, to make changes in our life. We look back at the year behind with great and gratitude, but also look forward about things we'd like to have that would be different. And so maybe you've done that. Maybe you're going to do that. That's not a bad thing. Um, you know, but let's ask the question, do people really change? I, I don't mean like cosmetically and change behaviors and change a few things on the external level, but do people really change at the deepest level of who they are? Some of you have remarked that I've, I've, I've changed. I've lost some weight in the last year. There's less of me than there used to be, and that's true. And some I have a guy came up to me and said, you're, you're, you're like a whole new person. And I appreciate that, but I'm really not. I'm the same guy, I'm the same idiot, just wearing different pants. Right? That's really the truth of it. Right? I still have the same hang-ups. I still have the same insecurities. I still have the same failures. I still struggle with the same things. God's still at work on me. I'm just wearing some different clothes now, that's all. Right? So, but, I mean, we could, there are, there's a level to which we can change ourselves. You could, by willpower, change some habits. You could make some cosmetic changes. And those are not insignificant. They're good for your health and for your life and whatever. But, I mean, change deep inside who you are. Is that possible? Do people really change there? Uh, it's a good question. It's worth asking. I had a friend years ago who came to our church and was like, we started talking that way in a small group he was in. And he's like, listen, I'm all for going to church and it's good for my kids, but... In my experience, people don't really change. Well, we're in a series the last couple of weeks, a little mini-series, the last week of 2019, now the first week of 2020, looking at that question. The series is called Made New, from one passage, remarkable passage in the New Testament, where we're talking about, is that possible, and how does that kind of change actually happen in our lives? To change at the level of your soul, who you really are, at the deepest level. And, and this letter we're going to look at from 2 Corinthians is written by a man named Paul. Paul, before he had his name changed to Paul, was known as Saul, Saul of Tarsus. Some of you know this, but if you're new to studying the Bible, Saul of Tarsus hated Christians. He was anti-Christianity, anti-the church, and, and was, uh, made it his life's mission. Uh, he was a Jewish zealot, a Pharisee, a religious uh, you know, fanatic, if you will. And he believed that it, God wanted him to, like, that Christianity was bad for the world. He was trying to remove it, to eliminate it. Maybe you're not that fanatical, but maybe you or somebody in your family or someone you know, you work with, thinks Christians are weird, doesn't like Christians, thinks they're hypocritical and strange. Maybe you've been there before. I just want you to know that the, the New Testament, three quarters of it, was written by a guy who started out hating Christians. Isn't that crazy and kind of weird and awesome at the same time? Paul then, in his mission to, to eliminate Christianity, an amazing thing happens. He meets Jesus, like literally meets him on a road. And in that meeting, Jesus changes him. And if anyone has ever been changed at the level where it matters most, at the level of your soul, it's Saul of Tarsus who becomes Paul the Apostle. And he's writing now to Christians and churches, telling them that this change is not just for him, it's for all who believe. It is possible. In fact, Paul's ministry then goes from stopping Christianity and, and stopping the church to building it. One of the primary ways he builds the church is by writing letters of challenge, of instruction, of, and of encouragement to churches. We're looking at the second letter he wrote to the church in Corinth. Inspired by God, written by Paul's hand, faithfully passed down to us today, the church at Chapel Street. So let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We'll read verses 16 through 21. It's really, it's an incredible passage. And by the way, uh, let me... Before I read this, if you want to know more about Paul's story, how he, how he was changed, you could, uh, this would be a good way to start your new year. Read Acts chapter 9 and Acts chapter 22. He tells his own story of transformation there. We won't get into it here this morning. But here's what Paul says to the church in Corinth about what it means to be made new. Verse 16. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. 
even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away, and behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This is an astounding passage. I will freely admit there's a lot of churchy words in here, righteousness and reconciliation, all these things, and we're going to talk about what they mean. Before we get into that, though, I just want to set the stage about what Paul's talking about. Last week, Pastor Brian preached about being made new, that verse that says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, they're, they're a new creation. Well, what's the overarching question he's answering here? Well, let me put it this way. What's the goal of the Christian life? What's the purpose or goal of the Christian life? Have you ever wondered that? Like, what is this about? What, is, what are we supposed to be about here? Maybe some of you, like me, grew up in a tradition uh, where you, they didn't say it this way, but you sort of picked up that the goal of the Christian life was to get to heaven. Anybody ever think that's the goal? Maybe you do right now. Anybody? You're not going to admit that. If you, just me? Get Jesus to get to heaven. Like, he's your get into heaven ticket. You've got to get Jesus into your heart so you, when you, you know, stand before God, you can go, oh, look, like got milk, got Jesus, I can get into heaven now. Like the, the whole goal is to get to heaven. Wherever that is, whatever that is, that's the goal. If that is the goal, then here's another question. What are we still doing here? I mean, on earth, really. And if the goal is to get to heaven, then once you trust in Jesus, why doesn't God just go, poof, you're with me, and then I'm looking for another one, right? Like, why are we still here? Are we just hanging on? Are we just biding our time till we get there? Or is there something more? I've said this many times, a friend of mine who's a pastor likes to say that too many Christians in America treat the life that they're supposed to live like going to the bathroom in a gas station. You go in, you do what you have to do as fast as possible, touch as little as possible, get out as quick as possible, right? <laughs> That's not the New Testament teaching about the life we're called to live. We're not just treading water or hanging on till heaven. It's about so, so much more than that. The emphasis in the Bible is not about getting out of here. It's about what to do once God gets a hold of you while you're here. What made new really means. So if you ever wondered, is this just about living a moral life or getting to heaven? What Paul is answering that in crystal clear terms for us here. And let's walk through this passage together. First, verse 16. We'll go back to that passage. Verse 16. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. What does that mean? Regarding according to the flesh. He's talking about how you see people. Do you see them on purely purely human terms. According to the flesh literally means, you know, according to the, the way the world sees, human terms. He means this. We used to look at people and think, that person's one of my people. They're like me. That person is one of them. To see people in categories, you know, conservative or liberal. You know, uh, the good people, the bad people. Residents, citizens, and, you know, aliens or illegals or, you know, undocumented. Gay or straight, Republican or Democrat, to categorize people and to see them that way. That's a person that annoys me, that's a person that I like. That's a person that doesn't like me, that's a person that I don't like, right? We do, we, we do, our culture almost conditions us to do this. What Paul is saying is, one of the first things about being made new is you see people differently. You no longer regard them according to the flesh. In fact, you don't see them in categories anymore, you see them even though you recognize there's differences, you see them as somebody that God loves, that God made in his image. And even though they might disagree with you on every level on, on a human, in human terms, that matters to God, that he died for, someone in need of hope and grace and someone God wants to reconcile back to himself. That's what it mean, part of what it means to be made new. And Paul says, by the way, the penny dropped for him. This change happened in his way he sees people when he saw Jesus differently. Notice what he says. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh. Meaning, when Paul was Saul, who hated Christians, he thought Jesus was just another guy. Just another guy. Just another false prophet with a Messiah complex. And there were lots of them in the first century. And then he meets him. He meets him. 
and everything changes. It's not just another guy. He's the one. He's God in the flesh. He is the Messiah, the Savior of the world, and the Redeemer of my life. And because of what he's done in me, I now see everyone else differently. So no cartoons today, just some words, but it'll hopefully it'll help you. First thing, we're made new. Paul says we're made new, and that newness impacts how we see. How we see ourselves and how we see other people. And then, moving on, that's what Paul says in verse 17, the famous passage that we always quote, you heard last week. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Meaning, I, you see the potential of what somebody could be if Jesus was to get a hold of their life. To make them new. And in verse 18, he goes on. All this is from God. Meaning, you don't make yourself new. It's not a restoration project that you're in charge of. God does it. He makes you new. Who, through Christ, reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. So we're not only made new, we are reconciled back to God. To be reconciled means to be brought back. I always have a fear that I'm going to spell something wrong because I'm not, you know, you're too close to it. But you get the idea. We're reconciled back to God. The most common reason for, tragically, divorce in America is irreconcilable differences. Just couldn't make it work. We got differences. Spiritually speaking, the Bible says, between you and God, there is a gulf of separation because of your sin. You, there are irreconcilable differences on your end. You cannot reconcile yourself back to God. You cannot do enough and be good enough to, to, to be brought back on your own strength. But God is the great reconciler. He can reconcile you back to himself. That's what he's done in Christ. We're going to get to that in a minute. To be made new by the power of Jesus Christ is to be brought back into a relationship with the Father. Let me put it like this. The goal of the Christian life is not to get into heaven. It's not escapism. It is to be restored to a relationship with the Father through Christ and to be given a message and a ministry of reconciliation. This is what Paul says in verses 18 and 19. I'll read it for you again. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. So what are we still doing here? If you've been made new and reconciled back to God, why are you still here? Paul says it. You've been given two things. You've been given a ministry... And you've been entrusted with a message. We'll talk about what they are here. You've been given a ministry and entrusted with a message. You thought only pastors had ministries. It's not true. Paul doesn't say we have entrusted the professionals with this message. We've given the pastors this ministry. He says if you are in Christ, you are made new. You have been reconciled to the Father. And by definition, you have a job to do. You're here for a reason. You've been given a ministry and entrusted with a message. What's the message? It's this. I know some of you think this way. Some of you are thinking, I don't know the Bible that well. I'm kind of new to this whole thing. I mean, I'm no biblical scholar. I don't know. I, can, I haven't even read through the whole thing. I wouldn't even know where to find Leviticus, let alone I haven't read it. Like, I'm not sure that I'm qualified. Okay, so you have some growing to do. So you have, God wants to grow you up. That's good. So do I, so do you. Can we all agree? We all have some growing to do spiritually and intellectually when it comes to understanding who God is. Is that true? Anybody fully formed and got it all figured out yet? Okay, right. No hands, good for you. That means you're not listening or being honest. But you've all been made, at least if you're in Christ, you've been made new. Your job isn't to be a Bible scholar. Your job is to say, look, I don't have it all figured out. I don't know all the answers, but let me tell you what he has done in me. Let me tell you what has happened in my life because of Jesus. That's the message. He's entrusted to you a message. What's the message? What's happened in your life? What's he done? What is he doing? That's your message. That's what he's entrusted to you. There is a separation that divides us. And we've been reconciled back to God through Christ. This is the message. 
Now, I want to spend the rest of our time on verses 20 and 21 because they're, they're just remarkable verses. I'll read them for you and we'll unpack them. Therefore, and they, they kind of, Paul's summarizing here what's come before, all the passage, the passage we just read. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Did you hear it? We are God's plan to get the message of reconciliation to the world. How many of you were here a number of months ago when Gary Haugen, the president of International Justice Mission, preached to us? When you're here for, if you didn't, I would encourage you, get on our church app or on our YouTube channel, go look up that sermon. It's fantastic. And you might remember when he was here, he asked this question. Okay, God, with all the brokenness and injustice and, and, and lostness in the world, what's your plan? What's your plan? You remember God's, his answer? He gave us the answer. Class, what's the plan? Us. And there is no plan B. Apparently, we are the plan. Now, no offense, but could God have done better? I mean, really, do you ever think that? Do you ever stop and think, really, this is the plan? Have you looked at these people? <laughs> have you looked at my life? There's got to be a better plan than this. But I'm going to trust that God knows better than I do. Paul says, we are ambassadors for Christ. We are his plan to communicate his great love and reconciling heart to the world. That's the plan. By the way, this is why, if you're wondering at Chapel Street Church, we have three campuses and we're praying about and seeking God for a fourth one. We don't know where that's going to be yet. We don't, we're not in a hurry, but we wanna, we, we, we're trusting that he'll do that for us in his time. Do you know why we do that, in case you're wondering? Not to build a big thing, to, to expand our kingdom. For this reason, more opportunities for more people to hear the message of reconciliation to know about the love of Jesus. That's why we're trying to multiply ourselves in neighborhood churches, so that more people in our community would come to know the message and the ministry of God's love and be brought into it. That's why. All right, let's take these verses in reverse order. First, verse 21. Verse 21 carries two massive, weighty theological uh, concepts that are hard to communicate in a very short period of time. We could spend multiple sermons on them. They're the idea of righteousness and atonement. Righteousness. He says that we are the righteousness of God. What, what does righteousness mean? We've talked about this. If you've been around here, you've heard me say that it's a very churchy word, right? I'm guessing most of you did not use that word this past week in your regular life. You know, Bill, have you, how's your righteousness? <laughs> you don't talk that way. What does it mean? To be righteous literally means, and some of you heard me talk this, about this before, to be right with, to be in right relationship with. And so what it means is then, to be right with someone, you must do right to them or do right by them. I can't be right with you if I'm behaving in ways that are not right toward you. That makes sense, doesn't it? So to be righteous or right with a person means I'm acting and behaving in ways that are right. Well, what's the standard of rightness? Well, in the Bible, we're told it's the righteousness of God, which is defined by his holy and perfect character, not by the laws of the land or social norms. Well, that's a problem. None of us can do right enough to measure up to God's holy, perfect character and nature. We cannot, therefore, be righteous by our own moral effort. We cannot be right with God by working hard to do right. How does a person, how does a man or woman get made right with God then? This is the whole message of the gospel. This is what it means to be made new. Pay attention now to verse 21. Therefore, he says, for our sake, he made him, who? Jesus, who knew no sin, he was sinless, to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteous, righteousness of God. I like to refer to this as the great transfer. Here's what Paul is saying. When you place your trust in Jesus Christ, I'm pointing to the cross now. Everyone look over at the cross. Right? When you place your trust in Jesus at the cross, something profound happens. All of your sin, all of your failure, all of your brokenness, all of the mess of your life gets transferred to him. He who knew no sin became sin for us. And all of his goodness and glory and mercy and love and beauty and righteousness is transferred to you. Is that a good deal? 
It's not a trick question. Is that a good deal? It's the best deal in the universe. The Bible calls this grace. You don't deserve it. You can't earn it. But God gives it. This is what theologians call imputed righteousness. It's not a righteousness that you manufacture, that you accomplish, that you achieve, that you live up to. It's a, man, it's a righteousness freely given to you by God because he loves you when you trust in Jesus. Martin Luther, who was an Augustinian monk before he became the great reformer of the Protestant Reformation, and was literally on a spiritual treadmill his whole life, full of angst, trying hard. He was as monkish as a monk could be, trying hard to be righteous in his own strength, and always fearing that he wasn't good enough, he wasn't right with God. And then he read Romans 3, 21 to 22, and it hit him like a hammer blow from heaven. Let me read it for you. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there is no distinction. Do you hear what it's saying? This is not a righteousness that you find within yourself. Who wants self-righteousness? That's a bad thing. It comes to you from outside of you. It's given to you by God through his son Jesus. This is the the, 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 the Stripping it all down to the essence of Christianity, I recognize my sin and brokenness and my separation from God. I am not right with the Father, but he loves me. And when I trust in his Son, all of my junk gets transferred to him. And all of his goodness and righteousness is transferred to me. So that when the Father looks at me and looks at you, if you're in Christ, he doesn't see your sin, which still exists, you're not perfect. What does he see? He sees the righteousness of his Son, Jesus, who covers you. I had a guy once come to our church said that in his experience, pastors were like used car salesmen. I think he meant that as an insult. <laughs> well, I am trying to sell you something. This is the best deal you will ever find in your life in the universe. The free exchange of your sin for his righteousness through faith in Jesus. That's the whole ballgame. That's what it means to be made new and reconciled. And when that happens to you, you're not just twiddling your thumbs till heaven. You're given a ministry and a message. That message of what he's done in your life. This is the power of the cross. This is what he's up to. Now, before we move on, you wonder, maybe you wonder about how to talk about this. How, how do you explain this to somebody? How do you share this message? How does it work? I'm going to tell you a little story that happened to me just this week. I was at the, uh, the fitness center, the gym. And by the way, I saw Fred Morris at the fitness center uh, on January 1st. You know, I stayed up late, my wife's birthday. We ate a bunch of bad food. And I thought, I, I want to start the new year, keep my streak alive. So I went to the gym. I saw like half of you there at the gym too as well, which was cool. And then I saw Fred Morris and he's like, hey, I've been to the gym every day this decade. <laughs> it was January 1st. Anyway. <laughs> a couple of days later, I'm leaving the gym. And I see a young man who is a, was a friend of my son's when they were like in, in grade school, middle school. I actually coached them in, in club wrestling. I hadn't seen him in a long time. I knew he'd been through some rough waters in his life and had some challenges. And he was all tatted up. And he said, Mr. Frazier. And I said, how are you doing? And we reconnected. And I said, tell me about your tattoos. So he told me about all, his whole sleeve of tattoos. And then he pulled his shirt off. I'm like, whoa. And, I said, <laughs> and he said, look at this one. It was a cross, like across his chest, like on this side. Big, giant cross. And he told me, what the, I said, what's the cross mean to you? And he gave me some kind of all over the place answer. And he said, Mr. Frazier, what does it mean to you? <laughs> Let me t Funny you should ask. <laughs> you got a minute? Sit down. Right? <laughs> you know what I told him? I told him, I mean, I didn't use imputed righteousness, but I told him this message. I told him about the great transfer. Here's what it means to me. It means God loves you so much that no matter what you've been through and all the mistakes you've made, that he's willing to trade all of that from you for his goodness and righteousness at the cross. If you place you, that's how much God loves you. That's what the cross means. He's like, right on. <laughs> so anyway it's the message he's entrusted you with that message and me he's given you a ministry that's what we're here that's why you're still here okay verse 20 we'll wrap up with verse 20 the amazing verse therefore we are ambassadors for Christ God making his appeal through us that should thrill you and humble you and maybe make you a little nervous right oh God is appealing to the world through your life. Now, when you hear the word ambassador, you think about different things. We, there's the political side, which we'll talk about, but sometimes we, we also think about, um, in the marketing world, brand ambassadors, right? The, the celebrity endorsements, people that you associate with a brand, because they're, they're always, so for example, Nike, who's a brand, the most famous brand ambassador for Nike? Michael Jordan, Tiger Woods, LeBron James, depending on your, your era, right? Uh, what about um, state, uh, nationwide insurance? 
Come on, I like this one. Peyton Manning? Like Peytonville? You like, I love that commercial. Well, maybe it's just me. It's working for me anyway. Or how about, how about Weight Watchers? Oprah, right? Oprah, up and down, Weight Watchers, the whole thing. We could go on. People that we, the point is you associate that person with the brand. Well, in a way, Paul is saying you should be a walk-in, talking commercial for the grace of Jesus Christ. You should be a brand ambassador. What's your brand? People should see your life and associate it with something of the goodness and grace and mercy and love of God. I say that, and I recognize, even as the words come out of my mouth, my own failure. You probably hear it and think the same thing. That's not to make us feel guilty, but to tell you what you're here for. God is making his appeal through you. He wants to. Now, this is God's marketing plan. <laughs> and it doesn't mean, here's what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean that you're walking up to people saying, listen, listen, I, I have my life together and I have the answers, I have things figured out, please follow me. What it means is, look, I, I was completely lost, broken. In many ways, I still have issues. But Jesus found me. He made me new. He reconciled me and restored me to back to a relationship with God. He's changed me. And he wants to find you and do the same for you. Can I tell you about him? The other aspect of what it means to be an ambassador is, you know, the idea of a foreign ambassador. We hear a lot about this in the news and on TV these days, social media, and it's not always good what goes on with our foreign ambassadors. But the idea is that you're a representative of one country while living in another country. You're, you're sent to a foreign land to, and you need to know that language of that land, you need to know the culture of that land so that you can speak clearly into it and understand it, but you must never forget that you're not a resident there. That country is not your home. You belong to, a, you have allegiance to another king, another nation. You represent the interests and power and will and purpose of another country while living in a foreign land. Hopefully you can see the connection Paul's making here. You are sent by God as an ambassador. We live in this world. We care about this world. We, we want to speak the language of the people around us, not just the, but understand their culture and the worldview. But at the same time, never, never forgetting. This really isn't my home. I represent the interests, will, purpose, love, and power of another king. You're, you're a representative of the, for, of the foreign power of the kingdom of God in the world. That's what it means to be ambassador. So the last part here is that you've been given a ministry and a message, and you've been sent as an ambassador. God sends you into the world as his representative. He's making an appeal through your life. So the primary question you should be asking, I should be asking, is this question. How can I best represent the interests, purpose, will, and love of, the, of King Jesus in this place? Tomorrow, when you go back to work, you're an ambassador. Yeah, yes, you're hired by your company, or you, maybe you run your company, and you've got a job to do, but you're actually, at a more, more profound level, sent by God there. So if, you're, if, you, if you have a, a job and you're thinking, you know, this is really isn't my destination, this is not my dream for my life, and my boss is kind of an idiot, I don't even like this job, the, you're, you, don't forget, God sent you there. It might only be for a year or six months. God sent you there as his ambassador. He placed you there. How you behave, how you treat your boss and your employer, how you treat your coworkers, how you carry out your, how hard you work, what kind of integrity you work with, it all matters. You've been given a ministry and a message. Any high school, middle school students here? Tomorrow, dun, 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 <laughs> when you go back to school. Oh, not just getting to the next semester. You're sent there. Listen to me, students, you're sent there. You're an ambassador there. By God, you've been given a ministry. You've been entrusted with a message. I talked to a man after last service. He stands back there at the door and greets almost every Sunday. He told me about his neighbor who was an atheist who for years they would have donuts together every week and the guy was like, I'm not interested, leave me alone, don't talk to me about it. And then one day, God cracked him open because he felt estranged from his kids and grandkids. And this, this chapel streeter was given a ministry and shared the message. 
told me beautifully how, he, how God gave him the words. Here's what he said. I'll just share it with you. I was, I was blown away by this because this came from God through his lips to this man. He said, who, this man who he's trying to reach was estranged from his son. He said, what if your son, who walked out on you 30 years ago and said, I forget you, Dad, what if he was to come to your doorstep tomorrow and say, I was so wrong. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry, Dad. What would you do? He said, oh, I could be tears. I'd embrace him. I'd embrace him. He said, that's what God is asking you to do. That's God's heart to you. I thought, oh, that's perfect. Right? You've been given a ministry, friends. You've been given a message. God is reconciling the world to himself. How is he doing that? Through Christ. But specifically, how in the world? Right? <laughs> I know. <laughs> he sent you. He sent us. What, what, what a perfect message for a new year. What are we doing here? This year, this decade, this life, what are we doing here? If you're in Christ, you've been made new. You've been restored to relationship with the Father through the, the love and, and sacrificial death of the Son. And you're not just treading water, friends. He's given you something to do, something to share, something to make known. He sent you as his ambassadors. He's sending us. And we're going to come to his table now as we finish this first Sunday of a new year. These are the symbols of that being made new and reconciled to God. The body and the blood of Jesus, the bread and the cup, are the, are the profound symbols that the church has observed down through the centuries of what it means to be made new and reconciled to the Father. And I want to be clear about something. If you're here for the first time checking out a new church in a new year, it does not matter to us if you're a member if, or if it's your first Sunday. All that matters is that you have been, placed your trust in Jesus. If that's true of you, you're welcome at his table because it's not our table, it's his. So in a moment, the ushers will pass the plate. You'll get two cups stacked together. Hold them in your hands. And once we've all been served, I'll come back up and lead us through the remembrance and the celebration of what it means we made new in Jesus. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the way that you pour out your grace in our lives, which we do not deserve, which we cannot earn. We thank and praise you that you took our sin onto you. You who were sinless and perfect became sin for us. And you transferred your perfection and righteousness into our hearts that we might be restored to a relationship with the Father in love. Now we come to your table, Lord, and we ask you to remind us through these simple, humble elements of the depth of your love through the sacrifice of your Son. We pray this in his name, Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.